Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Westboro. Uh, if you haven't seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. My day job is as an elder law attorney uh, at Myrick O'Connell, which is actually where many of us right here in Westboro. Um, but this is, this is not about my day job. It's about my friends, Frank and Mary. If you've seen my presentations, you've seen Frank and Mary, you know that their goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if that's Westboro, that means they want to stay right here. They don't want to move far away to Marlboro, where I live, or to San Diego, where their kids live. No, they want to stay home. So the point of the show is if you identify with Frank and Mary, who are the people you need to know? What are the programs you need to know about so you can live here forever? Uh, and so my co-host, Shelby Marshall, uh, kudos, who won a big election victory last night, you know, but I know she's not talking about this, right? Just as she got, you know, ne next thing she'll be looking for an increase in pay. So we don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to push that. Shelby uh, always finds these great guests, including um, our guest of, for today, whom we've seen in the last show. And, and this is really part of a series relating to some of the most significant um, uh, uh, things that are really happening uh, because, because Westboro is really focusing on becoming a sustainable community, which is really something. So, right. Shelby, whom do we have today for, uh, as yes. our Westboro guest? Yes, so we're welcoming back Sherrod Mehta. Um, Sherrod was on um, previously, and, and this is the second installment of a, of a series he's offered to bring to the community uh, to talk about climate change and, um, and really to kind of... Um, bring it home, I'll say, in a way that, that folks like us, unscientific folks, right, can understand it and, most importantly, understand what can we do about it? You know, what is Westboro doing about it? And what could we potentially, as individual consumers, kind of participants in this great world, uh, do about it? So today we're going to talk about solar energy. Um, I've actually been privy to this presentation before, um, or at least portions of it. Um, and um, I'm very excited, Sherrod, to welcome you back. Um, got great feedback on your uh, last presentation. Um, so I know Frank and Mary and friends will be excited to hear what you have to, to say today. Welcome. Yes, our, our reviews have been through the roof. So, you know, we're going to keep inviting you back until the reviews fall. So right. <laughs> we're, we're, looking, we're looking forward to the new presentation. So, Thanks. so. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Shelby, and uh, good morning, Arthur. Uh, so this is part two of the environment series. Uh, in part one, I had uh, introduced the uh, topic of the environment uh, and uh, about the issues of uh, climate change and global warming and uh, why there is, I uh, explained why there is this uh, urgency or race to uh, limit the average temperature, uh, global temperature to increase by less than one and a half degrees centigrade by the year 2050. And as part of the uh, solutions, I had offered uh, a few suggestions and specifically, uh, there are these newer technologies that are available for families and households that can be used to reduce uh, their uh, carbon footprint. And so the, the, the most uh, significant ones are uh, adopting uh, electric vehicles for transportation, uh, heat pumps for uh, building heating and cooling, and uh, transitioning to Zero, source, zero emission sources of electricity. And by adopting these three technologies, uh, we can take advantage of the improved efficiencies that are available through them, and also uh, uh, reduce the uh, carbon footprint of each household by as much as 85%. Today, I am going to focus on the uh, zero uh, greenhouse source electricity, specifically uh, solar systems. Now, before I go forward, I do want to mention that this is not a commercial advertisement. This is strictly being provided as a social service, and I am not representing the interests of any uh, institution, enterprise, or organization. So let's talk about uh, this uh, uh, one 
option for zero emissions residential energy source, which is solar systems. And I am going to go through th three things. I am going to uh, give an overview of the system, uh, solar system and its components. I'm going to uh, uh, talk about the financials. And then for those who are interested in getting started, where to, where to start and how to go about uh, uh, acquiring and installing such a system. Now, as far as the solar system is concerned, it consists of four basic parts. One is the solar panels, which you find on the rooftops. Uh, the second is the inverter, which I'm going to describe these components in a little bit more detail. Uh, and that inverter is inside the house. The third one is a net meter, which is similar to the electric meter that is found in most homes, except that this has some special features, which I'll describe. And the fourth is the electrical panel, which is really a distribution box, which receives electricity from all these various sources and distributes them to the different points of use within the house. A little bit more detail. So we know solar panels are uh, panels that you uh, must have seen uh, installed on rooftops and they take uh, radiation from the sun, solar energy and convert them into electricity. That's their purpose. The second component is called the inverter, which the, the primary purpose of the inverter is to convert a direct current to alternating current, DC to AC, because the solar panels actually produce DC current. But in our homes, we use AC current to run all of our applies, appliances and devices. So this inverter makes that uh, conversion. It has some other functions, but this is its main job. The third one is called the net meter, which is an electric meter with some special properties. One interesting property it has is it can go forward and backward. And it needs to have that because when the solar system is producing energy, uh, the rate at which the energy is produced is not exactly the same as the rate at which it's being consumed in the house. So the extra energy that is being produced is actually being transferred to the grid. And when that happens, the meter actually goes backwards. And during the night, the meter goes forward when there's no solar energy and the house is drawing electricity from the grid. So this is a bookkeeping device which keeps track of the flow of energy in both directions. And the electrical panels I just described is basically a distribution box. Now, I'm going to go into some of the uh, uh, aspects that go into the uh, uh, the choice of uh, installing a solar system in a particular house. Uh, the first one is something called solar access percent. And what solar access is, is let's say you have a house and the house was somewhere in a desert with no trees or any obstructions around it. So it would receive the maximum possible solar energy on the roof throughout the year. That's called the total solar energy available on that roof. You compare that with the actual location of the house. So most installers have access to this uh, database of three-dimensional maps called LIDAR maps. And by putting in an address in that database, they can get a 3D picture of the house and its surroundings. And from that, they can estimate and have the uh, weather uh, information uh, for the whole year on average for the last few years they can take all that information and figure out how much energy can be or electricity can be produced if a solar system is installed on the rooftop of that house so solar access is really the ratio of the actual sun that the rooftop will receive to the uh, total sun that it would have received if it were uh, if there were no obstruction. So typically this needs to, this is usually over 60, 70% in our area in order to make the solar system viable. But that's just a thumb rule and it really depends on the specific house and its specific consumption and all that number of factors go into it. 
The next thing I'm going to describe is the cost of a solar system. So typically, uh, when the system is uh, uh, sized, uh, it's uh, taken into account the number of solar panels that will be required to uh, 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 account for the total energy consumption of the house for the year. And generally, they're in the range of 6 kilowatt to 12 kilowatt is the size of the systems. And their price generally ranges from, let's say, $18,000 to $35,000, depending on the size. And over here, you see two bars. The first bar is the initial payment that would need to be made for the system. Uh, and the second bar is the net payment that uh, is due, is, uh, that has to be made because the federal government offers a very significant rebate on the price of the solar system uh, when you file the next year's uh, income tax return. And that's up to the current rate is 26%. So if you are spending $10,000 on a system, you will get back $2,600. So the net $7,600 is what you would owe to the system as an example. Now, as far as uh, uh, there are some financing options available, many banks offer what is called solar loans. These are typically uh, for a duration of 10 years, and some banks will charge interest only for a period of up to one year. And they know that uh, within, the, within that one year, you will be filing for your taxes and getting that big uh, rebate of the 26% of the total cost of the loan. And hopefully you'll pay it back uh, as the a part of the principal. And then the bank will reamortize the remaining amount and reset the period of payback back to nine or 10 years. Uh, the solar uh, rebate from the federal government was 26% and it was supposed to go down, but it has been extended to 2022 after which it will go down to 22% and uh, eventually it will go down to zero. So the cost of the solar systems is coming down, but at the same time, the rebates are going away. So there is this sort of a wash between the two. Uh, Sharad, um, yeah. th this is really interesting. I, first of all, I wasn't aware of uh, the loan amounts uh, provided to banks. So I think that's really helpful information for folks to understand, particularly around them recognizing that period of um, the receiving the tax credit. Um, so yes. really interesting information on this slide. Great. Um, I know you don't have a crystal ball um, or even a solar powered one in front of you, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, given the current um, Biden administration's, you know, um, position on um, climate change and, you know, uh, uh, rejoining the accord, is there a sense out there that that I mean, is it legislated that the 22% goes to zero, that that's just kind of locked in there and it would require an act of Congress, no pun intended, to change it? Or is that something that the Biden administration, through its work, can just kind of flip a switch on? Do you happen to know that? Uh, no, actually, what happens is, you know, as I was saying, the solar systems by themselves, they are improving the uh, efficiencies in the manufacturing and other processes. So the solar system prices are going down by themselves. Sure. And uh, this will really depend upon what, uh, how much the prices are, are coming down and how okay. many people have actually adopted. Because as I said, there is an urgency to get as many homes solarized as possible. Sure. So there is these factors that come into play and I'm sure the government will be watching all of these things very carefully before deciding uh, what, to go. Uh, what changes to me. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So the next thing I want to show you is something called a cash flow pro forma. This is an important document that will be produced uh, by an installer in general. And this looks like an eye chart, but it isn't, trust me. Um, it consists of, uh, the, the cash flow pro forma consists of two parts. The first part is a, a description of the proposed system. And the second part gives you some financial information. So next I'm going to, we're going to take a closer look at each of these parts of the cash flow performer. The first part, which is called the, uh, which is, which includes the description of the system. It has this kind of information, uh, total system cost, how much energy it can produce, 
how many panels are in uh, will be installed what is the capacity of each panel what is the smart power rate which is a term that i'll describe shortly what is the annual consumption of that residential home so this is sort of a tech an overview of the system uh, that is being proposed the second part is contains the financial information so here uh, there are a few columns and i want to describe them briefly the first one has the year uh, solar panels typically have a warranty of about 25 years so this is showing projections of income and expenses so one way to look at a solar system is really as a business so here there are some expenses and there are some incomes and we're going to take a quick look at them so one source of income is what is called the smart payment smart program what this means is that for every unit of electricity that's produced by the solar system, the government makes, the state government makes a payment to the owner of the system, which is called the SMART uh, payment, which stands for Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target Program. So for each unit, you get a certain sum of money. The second source is really... Uh, um. It's really not an income, but it's a saving. So this is the amount that you would have been paying on your electricity bill on a month. And that savings, I would consider that as a, as a type of income. And that is, um, uh, it put in, and remember that uh, the cost of solar, uh, so cost of electricity is going up over the years. And so every year your savings actually increase because uh, you're not paying that uh, electricity bill on a monthly basis. So all these are summed up here. This gives you the total re revenue. And this column here gives you the solar loan payment, which is the uh, monthly installment that you would pay to the bank for your uh, solar system. And that's usually for uh, 10 years. The smart program is typically for nine years and the uh, loan amount is for 10 years. And you can, uh, if you have a net balance remaining with this, this last column is the net remaining, you can actually put it back into the payment of the principal of the loan and you can finish this loan earlier. So typically uh, this loan can be uh, five to 10 years is the typical period by which most people are able to finish. Uh, paying off the loan and after that the electricity basically you don't have to pay for the electricity and in a net sense you get uh, from the cash flow performa you get the total amount uh, that uh, the positive that you would stand uh, in, uh, by by uh, getting such a system now there's also another source of payment which is Let's say you're uh, producing a thousand kilowatt uh, hours of energy and you uh, consume 900 kilowatt. So the one, uh, the balance that remains, the utility will actually pay you uh, for that uh, net energy that you deliver to the uh, grid. So that's another source of uh, income for this system. But Shara, just to be clear, yes. that that payback that you you um, just mentioned um, is not factored here in this pro forma, right? That's in addition to. That's in addition to because okay. that varies depending on how sure. much is. Sure. Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank and, you. And, and so, just one question back on that yes. one. So, 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 as if I put in that system this year in 2021, yes. um, is that is my mass smart payment guaranteed during those nine years? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. That, I see. Yes. That I see. Is so I'm not. I couldn't. I couldn't end up five five years through with the common. No. 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 These are all. Uh, these are all uh, government uh, commitments. So. Okay. Uh, I don't right. think. That's. This is really something. So at the end of the ten years, it looks like I'm even. Look. Look. Uh, well, no, you actually come out ahead. Yeah. Actually, ten hours years, you're even. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. See, this is, I wouldn't pay much attention to the individual numbers. It really does right. does depend very much on the individual cases. Right. But I am more, uh, what I'm presenting here is the format of how the information is presented in the cash flow performer. Right. The right. numbers right. you Thanks. should uh, care no. much for right now. Right. Okay, so this is uh, an example that I'm showing in our case, before we had put in the uh, uh, solar system, 
this was a pattern of consumption that we had month wise. So July, August, September, we're consuming 600, 700 or 400 units uh, per month. And after we install the system, this is what that profile looks like. So in the winter months, we are still uh, consuming energy from the grid, but for the rest of the months, uh, we're solidly uh, not consuming anything from the grid. And in fact, we are actually uh, giving something back to the, to the grid, which is going into our account. And so our energy bill looks like that. Uh, this is a negative number you get because that's the credit that's on our account uh, because we have produced more than we have uh, actually consumed, uh, which would be available for us for the winter months and for uh, other, uh, you know. Sharad, can I ask you a question? So you're, I'm sure, well aware of the Westboro Power Choice Program, the community yes. aggregation. Yes. So um, does this model and calculation um, work the same way if you're part of the community aggregation program? We've had that presentation on before here. Yes. Um, so, so you can still sort of give back the energy, even though you're operating through that, you know, you're, you're receiving um, the, the, the benefits of community aggregation. Right. So I don't know the exact answer to that question, but uh, okay. I can find out and get back to you. Okay. Well, we can we can follow up on that, but that would yeah. be something you know certainly someone would want to understand. Yep. Yes. Sure. All right. So the the uh, after the system is installed, one uh, uh, there's an app that you get on your phone, and this app uh, this is one of the pages of the app. So it shows you month by month how much energy was being produced by this system. And it also gives you a comparison year by year of, the, uh, of that energy being produced. There are some other pages on this uh, app, like what is your current production at this particular moment and what is your daily production and so on. There are some more details, but that information is right on your fingertips and you can check by your app uh, whenever you want. So the next piece I'm going to talk about is where to start. If someone is interested in installing a solar system, where do you start? Um, so the, the first thing to do is to uh, find a list of uh, local solar system installers. You can find uh, many of such websites uh, on the internet. And you can read their reviews, uh, customer ratings, and all that, and shortlist three of them and contact them. Uh, the first thing they'll do is they'll ask you for your electricity bill, uh, which uh, from that bill, what they're mainly interested in is your consumption pattern. And from that, um, they'll also pay a visit to your uh, installation site. And based on the information that I talked about earlier, they will generate a quote for you. Uh, and so you can review the details and also ask for three references, independent references, and you can contact them or should contact them with, you can use email or phone or whatever, and uh, get the feedback and uh, uh, basically use that to choose your uh, the contractor that you, that you feel most comfortable with. One of the things they will assess is the condition of the roof. Because if the roof is very old, it is actually uh, advisable to uh, replace the roof with a new roof before putting on the solar system. Um, but if it's relatively new, then there's no issues there. Because uh, if the roof needs to be replaced, the uh, solar panels would have to be taken off, the roof would have to be worked on, and then the solar panel would have to be replaced, put back again. So there is that cost that you would have to consider uh, if that is the, uh, the situation for the particular case. So anyway, after getting all that, uh, all the, going through all these steps, you uh, finalize a schedule and uh, sign the contract and basically you're good to go. Wow. So the, uh, at the end, I just want to sort of summarize the pros and cons of a solar system. Um, so it uh, actually does reduce the electricity bill. Uh, and really the thing to consider when you're uh, considering a solar system is mm -hmm. when uh, you have a monthly bill that you pay right now, which is a, an expense. And if you go with this system, you would be paying a, uh, you would not be paying that bill, but you would be paying a, uh, a monthly installment on your 
uh, solar loan. So the difference between your current bill and your monthly installment would be the additional payment that you would need to consider. And whether or not you can afford it uh, would be uh, the, an important decision factor that will go into this uh, decision making. Um, so reduced electricity bills is one advantage. Uh, you get financial support from the government, which is quite significant. You reduce your carbon footprint. Um, uh, by as much as 30% uh, could be uh, achieved by this one step. And then it requires little maintenance. You get a warranty of uh, 25 years on these solar panels and the subsystems also have other warranties. Uh, the inverter uh, has a lesser warranty, but they, uh, they are, uh, if the product breaks down before, then it gets replaced. Uh, and then it does add value to the house. On the negative side, uh, the, there is a high initial cost, but as I mentioned, it's really the difference between the loan payment and the monthly electricity bill. That's the one that you would consider. You get a, a weather dependence. So when the, there's no uh, sun, the, if it's snow or rain, there is no electricity being produced. Uh, you cannot take the system with you when you move. There are limitations from surroundings. Uh, if there are a lot of trees around, uh, solar access percent uh, may get affected. And there are certain roof types, like for sandbox type, type homes, where um, there may be some limitations on putting uh, solar systems. Uh, also for uh, condo owners and renters, there are some community solar systems uh, available and also the community choice program that Westboro offers, where for a small increase in the uh, uh, unit rate, you can actually ask for 80% or even 100% of your energy be uh, from renewable sources. So that is another uh, option that's available uh, for, um, uh, for town residents. So the last thing I do want to say is when the grid power fails, unfortunately, the solar system will have to shut down and does not supply power. This is because the solar panels, the energy that they're being produced, they have to be, the load has to be balanced. So what is not being used would need to, uh, used in the house will need to go somewhere. And if the grid is not available, then that's not possible. So as a safety mechanism, the solar panel has to shut down. That, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, Shira, because I, I know you, that's often a question whether it's um, pro or con to the to the homeowner. So I appreciate you explaining why that happens. Yes. It's really to protect the house. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. So yeah. that's all I had, Shelby. Shira, that was great. That was yeah. great. It was just fascinating. You know, and you come to the end and you say, so in other words, I can like break even for the first 10 years, make a lot of money over the 25 years, and I'm helping the community at the same time. That's right. That's not a bad, that's not a bad, that's not bad. No, uh, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, 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 that's and good. remember the sun is falling on your roof every day. And every so that's day. energy being wasted the way Waste. I see it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. So yeah. even, even if you're not a cheapskate, but you just hate waste. Look at that, yeah. it's tremendous. But now, so Sherrod, thank you so much. I know that we're running a little close on time and Shelby, I always wanna leave a minute at the end for you to say, if there's, is there something that folks need to know about over the next week that's going on in Westboro? Wow, um, I, um, I could go on Arthur, but I'm just gonna say, I, I wanna congratulate all the uh, candidates who ran for office, um, win or lose, it was, fantastic to see a really chock full ballot. Um, uh, I think it's important because when new faces run, um, it brings new ideas to the table and uh, it uh, builds a better Westboro. And so um, really excited that we had a great, uh, not only candidate turnout, um, but voter turnout. So 13% of Westboro voted, um, which in a local election, while I'd love to have seen it at 20%, I'll take 13. A um, lot of work to do before the board. We'll have that another show. Arthur, I'd love to just have a conversation, you know, about that at some point, yeah. um, you know, about my ideas individually, and, and we can certainly welcome other board members. So, um, Sherrod, thank you so much. Great show. Arthur, thank, thank you. you. Shelby, thank you very much. Sherrod, always a pleasure. Thanks. We'll see you in the next show. This is a great series. Once again, keep our ratings going up. And folks, thank you so much for watching. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next installment of Frank and Mary 
here in Westboro featuring Sherrod Mehta as part of his miniseries. Thank you. We'll <laughs> see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.